Um, Quentin Groom's focus is on biodiversity, informatics, and invasive biology. He uses data science methods to explore hidden patterns within data. His current work revolves around applying information technology to share scientific information, especially in the areas of invasive species, taxonomy, and citizen science, all of which are really important um, to our subjects as well. Engaged in various projects, including B3, BICI, I don't know, I'm sure that's an acronym, probably bicycle. big. Yeah, bicycle, okay. Um, Tetris and Garden. He contributes to efforts to understand and preserve biodiversity, and with skills in biodiversity informatics and an understanding of botany, taxonomy, and biology, he navigates through the complexities of ecology, species interactions, and plant diversity. Um, all of this is great. And now over to you, Quentin. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me this evening. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, the biodiversity crisis to some extent and our contribution to trying to solve that. I'm going to frame the problem, uh, talk a bit about policy and the visions of the future policy, targets in policy, um, some of the recent history uh, of biodiversity informatics and some of the projects we've been working on within that, and then talk a little bit about the future of biodiversity ob observations and opportunities. So Mizer Botanic Gardens in Belgium, and that's where I come from. Uh, we're a sort of full service uh, botanic garden, but we get involved in many different aspects of biodiversity research. So I'm sure you know this already. Um, there are a lot of species out there, uh, about 300,000 vascular plant species, which is the ones I'm mostly interested in as a botany. But I'm also aware that there are another eight to nine million species in total, uh, which have some bearing on the situation as it is already. Biodiversity is extremely complicated. Uh, you can see the three different organisms here, the, the two, uh, the fungi and the algal symbiont and the plant or tree it grows on. About six to eight percent of the Earth's surface is covered in lichens and there are about 20,000 species and they're all just as complicated, if not more complicated than the one we see here. As the name suggests, biodiversity is varied. Um, there are an awful lot of different species. They have uh, their own unique traits. Uh, just in this genus, which is Oxalis, uh, which is one that interests me particularly, there are about 550 species. And biodiversity is intrinsically linked to the environment. So it always strikes me that uh, if you look at the atmosphere of Mars, for instance, it's 95% carbon dioxide. 3% uh, nitrogen, 2% argon. If you look at the Earth, well, you know, it's 20% oxygen. The amounts of carbon dioxide, at least at the moment, are extremely small. And if you look at this bird, uh, or this picture of a bird, um, that bird and all the carbon within it was actually uh, sucked out of the atmosphere by photosynthetic organisms and as part of a food chain that was incorporated into that bird. If you look at water on Mars, it would have the pH of battery acid. If you look at this water, it's turbid because it's full of life and it's a neutral pH. And this all works together in one big ecosystem. The rocks of the Earth are um, how they are because of life on Earth and because we have an oxygen atmosphere and it's all integrated together. Biodiversity is also relevant on, on very different scales, uh, all the way from a global scale uh, where the climate is dependent on biodiversity, right down to microscopic scales uh, like diatoms and things like this that go on to generate uh, some uh, silicaceous rocks, for instance, all down to biodiversity and the complexities of scale as well. And all this biodiversity interacts with each other. So we have uh, predator, uh, predation uh, of one organism on the other. We have competition between organisms. We have parasitism. Uh, we have in microbial interactions like, um, like it with le bacteria and legumes, but also many fungi and trees and things like that. And so, for instance, in these pictures, one I really like is the bats up in the top right-hand corner, because although they aggregate together uh, in their roost, in this case, at the top of a church, they all stay a certain distance apart from each other because they need a little bit of space to stretch their wings. And so they don't knock each other off their uh, perch. 
And so species are constantly interacting with each other for all sorts of positive and negative ways. And just to emphasize that point, I made this uh, species interaction model of our botanic garden, where I put all the species we know exist in our botanic garden in and all the interactions between those species. And you can quite easily see it makes one big interaction network. All the plants that we've planted in the botanic garden interact with other species. All of the wild plants in the garden interact with other species. Uh, we have cats coming in the neighborhood and they eat some of the wild birds in the garden. Uh, we have bees uh, cultivated in the garden and also uh, organisms interact directly with homo sapiens, such as ticks that are, um, that are parasites on the deer in the garden, et cetera, et cetera. And so whether cultivated, domesticated or wild, um, everything interacts with everything else in a big ecosystem. So that brings me on to policy. And given all of that complexity of biodiversity and the difficulties of understanding that, how would we find, provide relevant information to policymakers to give them any chance of, of uh, producing policies that are good, not just for human beings, um, but also biodiversity? And hopefully through, do, through um, good policy for biodiversity also makes good policy for humans. In policy, we have organizations like the uh, International uh, Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, known as IPBES. Uh, they produce reports uh, from scientists where they collate information from uh, published literature to provide the best knowledge we have and um, on biodiversity, hopefully to try and influence policy. Uh, I was involved in the invasive alien species assessment, but there are other assessments on pollination, on land degradation and restoration. Uh, there are regional assessments such as the European and Central Asian one, and uh, there are also a global assessment as well. On a more local scale, uh, we think of things like conservation um, on a, a very, very local scale. Um, and we can look at local issues such as habitat destruction, deforestation, overexploitation, pollution of all different kinds of water, air, noise, light pollution, plastic pollution, pesticide and herbicide pollution. We have invasive species who I'm particularly interested in from a biological standpoint, but also seal soil degradation and water scarcity. And a very interesting human wildlife con conflicts like uh, great white sharks and the need to conserve them for good conservation reasons, but the conflict there may be with human beings as well. But all those local issues, because all these ecosystems are so connected, are also global issues. So this is just really a matter of scale. So all of these things have, uh, um, have both local and uh, global influences. And so policy has to be uh, uh, policy relevant data and information has to be both on a local and a global scale as well. And this adds to the complexity of what we're trying to deal with. On a global scale, uh, we have uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you work in biology, you will know very well um, 14 and 15 on the goals on life below water and life on land. But Almost all the goals have some relevance to biodiversity, but there's some others uh, such as zero hunger and good health and well-being, which are, can be directly related to um, to biodiversity. Um, you, you've already just lived through a pandemic, and so you will recognize that. Uh, but there's also clean water and sanitation and climate action, which has direct relevance to biodiversity as well. Now, uh, back in 2011, um, we, we, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity set the IKE biodiversity targets um, to try and stem the uh, rate of biodiversity loss. These were evaluated, I think, last year. And as you probably know, uh, none of these targets were achieved globally um, and none of the countries achieved all of the targets. Although, to be fair, a few countries achieved some of the targets. This is not very encouraging, um, but we uh, put those aside 
And now um, we have the Kunming Montreal Global, Bi Global Biodiversity Framework, which has a vision of its own. And that vision is that by 2050, biodiversity is valued, conserved, restored, and widely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits essential to all people. So I can see you rolling your eyes a bit now, even though I can't actually see you. Um, thinking as I often, often think in my more cynical days, that we've got no hope at all. But I think it's worth looking back uh, over the past 25 years and seeing how far we've come and thinking how uh, we can potentially achieve this uh, by 2050 if we work together. So, for example, what, what has happened over the past 25 years? Well, 25 years ago, uh, we had the first genome of a plant and the first genome of uh, an insect. They were published in 2000. And now uh, making genomes of organism is relatively commonplace and can be done in fractions of the time. We have the internet, uh, which in 2000 had about 250 million uh, users. We now have uh, five and a half billion users. And the internet is uh, incorporated into almost everything we do. The bandwidth we use now is far, far greater than it was in 2000. And with smartphone technology um, and social media, uh, there has been a complete renaissance in uh, citizen science, generating millions of records on biodiversity and all sorts of information on biodiversity as well. Um, we've gone through a big data era. We have things like cloud computing. Um, you've obviously seen all the impacts of artificial intelligence, and they will only continue to go on. Um, they're a game changer for things like biodiversity modeling and for analysis of biodiversity uh, data sets as well. Um, the Global Biodiversity uh, Information Facility, GBIF, was founded at the beginning uh, of the 2000s. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, we have better awareness of climate change and habitat destruction. Uh, we have a shift towards ecosystem-based approaches in conservation and a growing recognition of the importance of involving uh, local communities in conservation. And all of these things are very positive steps and will help us achieve uh, what we need to achieve in the next 25 years. So I work in biodiversity informatics. Uh, this is very much a 21st century discipline. It did exist in the 20th century, um, but um, has really emerged uh, this uh, century. Uh, the late Frank Bisbee wrote this paper in 2000, The Quiet Revolution, Biodiversity Informatics and the Internet. And I think now uh, there was perhaps a quiet revolution at that time, but uh, more and more biodiversity informatics gets a lot noisier and a lot more capable in what it's able to do and uh, can be a little bit more than a quiet revolution. I mentioned GBIF. Uh, GBIF arose from the uh, OECD um, back in 1999 and was launched in 2001. So in less than 25 years, we now have uh, more than two and a half billion observations of biodiversity from across the world out of getting on for 100,000 uh, uh, data sets and more than 10,000 publications have been published uh, with data published through GBIF. Those data are used for all sorts of things. There are very uh, fundamental research on things like evolution, but there are also some very practical things looking at uh, um, disease epidemiology, invasive species management, and things like that. We also have uh, organizations like uh, the Biodiversity Information Standards Organization. It was founded a long time ago as, as the Taxonomic Databases Working Group um, back in the 1980s, uh, but has changed uh, beyond all recognition, really. And one of its key standards that is used throughout biodiversity informatics is Darwin Core. And it's not the only standard they look after, but it's certainly one of the uh, most important for the uh, interchange and interoperability of biodiverse uh, data. So uh, if you don't know Darwin Core well, there's a whole reference guide online. It's not a static standard. There's a very active group of people who maintain uh, Darwin Core. 
Um, there are great debates online about the addition of new terms and things like this. It's a slow process, as many of you, if you've tried, uh, will attest to, um, but it's a very rigorous process of making sure that there are standards, available uh, terms and control vocabularies in some cases for communicating data on biodiversity. So for instance, I was involved in uh, getting the new term degree of establishment uh, into Darwin Core. We needed this for research we were doing on invasive species um, and it contains the vocabulary as well. So we can do that. So these are not static things. They're very important. They're all open um, uh, to be used by anybody under a, a Creative Commons uh, uh, license waiver. Talking of Creative Commons, uh, this was also founded in 2001. So in the last 25 years, um, and uh, it was, they released their first license in 2002. Without Creative Commons licenses, we couldn't be able to do any of the work we're doing um, because it's just so much work. Uh, how, if you have to talk to every per person that's potentially going to provide data, get a data use agreement um, with them, make sure that that data use agreement won't cause you problems when you come to publication, uh, making sure they're all compatible with one another, making sure they have common standards, etc. We need people to uh, publish their data with a clear license that lets us know what we are and able to do with their data. So if you see any of these symbols on data or a publication, you know exactly what you can do. It's about having the clarity to be able to do that. It's very much become, uh, as we used to say, if it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. Well, very much now, it's if it's not open, it doesn't exist because it's just too much work to deal with the aggregation across uh, large time spans, across large spatial areas. If you don't have the permission to use those data, it will just get ignored. Uh, 2016, so relatively recently, uh, but in the last 25 years, uh, we had the publication of the Fair Data Principles, which I'm sure you all know, uh, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is not about whether data should be open or closed. It's about uh, good data science principles on how you describe data, use um, stable identifiers for different entities, uh, describe data properly with metadata and um, how data uh, should be um, used and how the data was created in the first place. In 2013, uh, uh, Henry Gay Pereira um, published the Essential Biodiversity Variables Framework. Um, essential Biodiversity Variables uh, are similar to the uh, Essential uh, Climatic Variables of the IPCC, except in this case, they relate to biodiversity. And it's a list of um, variables that's important for collecting data on, um, on biodiversity, specifically to inform policy. And uh, the use of this framework has been endorsed by uh, IPBES and on the Commission on Biological Diversity, and I'll talk more about it later. So uh, during the 2000s uh, here in Belgium, I led a project called Trias. Uh, in that Trias, we did many things. It was about tracking invasive alien species. Um, but one of the things we did was try and put forward uh, the, uh, the idea that the people collecting biodiversity data are not doing it out, the, um, um, uh, out of their own goodwill. They're doing it because they, they want to do something with those data. They may be decision makers who want to uh, track the success of their policies. They might be scientists who want to uh, discover something and write papers on that. Or they might be volunteers who just find it very interesting and a fun uh, job to do and quite happy to share their data as well. Or there might be conservationists who are trying to uh, monitor invasive species on a, a reserve or something like that. Um, all of those people are collecting data and potentially will share it with you, um, but they need to be motivated and they need to be motivated by showing that their data are useful, but also by us providing things back to them in terms of an analyzed data. So we were taking uh, checklists and occurrence records from them, creating indicators from them and, and uh, combined checklists. So we have a full checklist of, of invasive species in Belgium now. You might then uh, create risk models out of those, use, use the data for risk assessment. In our case, we were doing it for invasive species. 
And then you can create data products which are useful to the people who created the data in the first place, which may be, in the case of policymakers, risk assessments. Um, volunteers might just like to see maps and perhaps uh, future predictions of distributions, um, or maybe just like to see a combined list of, so they can see what species they're missing from their life list, for example. So, oops, skip to one. So a similar diagram is that of uh, the essential biodiversity variables uh, that came out around the same time, looking at how observations can be combined uh, into data sets, um, into what we call biodiversity data cubes that have dimensions of taxonomy, time, and space. So we have analysis-ready data sets that we can then model and create uh, derivative data sets from that you can then create indicators that can potentially be used for um, for policy. All of this has to be done on a very repeatable way. So traditionally, uh, biodiversity um, analysis has been done by PhD students over the course of their, their research. They probably spend the first year collecting all the wrong data, the second year uh, finally figuring out what they should be collecting and doing that, and the third year writing it all up and publishing. Um, this is not very effective if you're trying to, to influence policy. What you need are repeatable workflows um, that are standardized, that can uh, have full provenance of where all the data is coming from, and that the output can be produced on a, on a regular basis. Uh, this uh, particular workflow, that this diagram is here from Rise Over et al. Uh, 2020, is about publishing checklist data from taxonomists who store their data often in in spreadsheets, and then having a repeatable workflow that allows them to publish uh, new new data um, to GBIF through their integrated publishing toolkit um, as or when needed. We also did a sort of uh, similar thing with uh, risk mapping for invasive species. So we recently just published um, a full workflow for doing um, ensemble modeling of invasive species using, I think, three or four different uh, models of um, uh, just species distribution models, um, fine resolution climate data, and uh, projection data in, uh, under uh, three different uh, climate projections as well. And all of this is repeatable. That means as soon as a new data cut set comes along, and new data, you can add it to that and rerun your workflow and spit out uh, maps and uh, the results of those models too, including all the uncertainty on those model distributions as well. And of course, on top of all of that, you can create indicators of change. Uh, this is often very difficult because of all the biases in the data. Uh, but these are the data we've got. We can't do anything about the biases except uh, maybe in the future try and improve the way we collect data. Um, but there are lots of things we can do about it. And uh, with some interpretation, we can try and understand uh, uh, what these indicators tell us. So uh, what does GBIF contain? Um, it this was back in 2017. I, I uh, analyzed GBIF, which was quite a long time ago now uh, on the grand scheme of things. But at that time, about 60% of the data uh, were from volunteers and so-called citizen scientists. Now, I think that percentage may have increased in recent years. I'm not really sure. I don't think anyone has done a, a thorough analysis of that. And it's becoming extremely difficult these days to, to separate what is a citizen science data set from a, uh, a a, a um, professional data set as more professionals start to use the same tools as citizen science for collecting their data. That said, I think um, GBIF, that percentage in GBIF is actually going to decline. I'll talk a bit about that in a second. But um, the numbers of citizen science data are likely to increase. They're just likely to become a smaller and smaller percentage of the total amount of data. So lots of other data are coming in from lots of other different methods. So remote sensing um, and other kinds of earth observation data are bringing data of all different kinds that can be combined with observation data, but also creating observations of biodiversity themselves. So it can be used for habitat mapping, but it can also be used in certain cases for, in, for spotting invasive species themselves, uh, measuring uh, by, um, uh, 
um, biomass production. It can detect uh, events like uh, fires, and you can use things like radar for tracking birds, um, insects, and possibly even bats, I suppose. Um, collections. So Mizer Botanic Garden was one of the first to digitize all of its collections. Um, obviously, these are all plants. Collections are super important globally. Um, they have uh, records that you can trace to a voucher specimen, so they're very high quality, and um, they cover very many different species, much more than some of the other kinds of observation data we have. Uh, our particular data set has about 2.8 million specimens, um, and all of this is on our website and on GBIF, and about two and a half of those, two and a half million of those have an Im image associated with them as well. And I think uh, it's about 240 million preserved specimens data are now on GBIF, so not a small amount. Overall, uh, there are probably about two billion globally, and that uh, digitization effort is continuing and increasing. If you look at the number of images from specimens on GBIF, uh, the top line, well, this is a logarithmic graph, so a straight line is a, a logarithmic increase. Uh, the top line, the plants, as you can see, it's increasing logarithmically. Uh, but if you look at the insects, which are much le less at the moment, if you were to extrapolate that line uh, to where it overlaps the, the plants, you can see that in maybe three or four years, the number of insect pictures on GBIF is gonna start um, being the same or exceeding the number of plant images as well. So digitalization is continuing uh, and is already still an important aspect of um, the digital data available. We have lots of standardized surveys. And these are done both by professionals and by amateurs. Um, this was the results of one particular one uh, I ran in Northumberland when I used to live there and uh, was run uh, mostly by volunteers. And uh, we have new standards coming through Tadwig as well for supporting this kind of uh, survey. Uh, uh, a particular standard called Humboldt Core is used for that. We have tracking data now uh, increasingly being produced for individual organisms. Uh, you often think of birds, but uh, there are many organisms that it's worth tracking. And the resolution of these data is only improving uh, with every year. We have insect traps like this malaise trap, which can be uh, the results of which can be studied by entomologists, or um, the results can be ground up and studied through eDNA. And I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in a second. We have more traditional tracking of birds uh, through ringing and, and banding, like uh, this uh, uh, California condor. Um, a lot of these data are closed still. Um, probably because it's been done for so long and it's just part of their tradition. Um, but I would hope that eventually they will see the light and share these data because there are super important baseline data for birds. We have camera traps, which have been around a few years, um, but there's a lot of development of automation in this area. So at the moment, uh, you have to set your camera trap out, you have to pick it back up, you put the SD, SD card in your computer. Uh, what is coming along in the not so distant future are much more automated systems. Uh, you can use AI potentially, AI together with human beings to be able to identify what organisms are seen on the camera traps. Um, and we have uh, standards like uh, camera tap DB, which are going to be used to be able to make those data interoperable and be able to create workflows that are going to publish those directly to GBIF without having uh, a long, long time uh, lag between uh, capturing those data on a camera and getting those data published. What we should be aiming for is days, um, certainly not weeks, certainly not months, and as is in the moment, years, um, but that is a work in progress. And we have other kinds of loggers, such as sound monitors um, that are used uh, for birds, for bats, for whales, and all sorts of things that create sounds. Um, and we have other kinds of data logger as well. Artificial intelligence, I've already mentioned, but um, uh, uh, that, that can be used in many different uh, 
um, systems. I mean, the example here is for fishing in fish tanks, uh, but just a sort of proof of concept, then you can identify different kinds of fish and you can see the obvious applications for those. And uh, artificial intelligence and also certainly computer vision has been used for quite a while now on different apps for citizen scientists that both helps them learn different organisms and how to identify them, um, which makes that a lot more fun and a lot more, um, uh, the word, engaging for um, citizen scientists to use those apps and collect data and share those data as well. Uh, one thing we've been looking at recently is secondary data. So this is not a photograph of Isodonta mexicana, the grass carrying wasp. It's a picture of two organisms, the Isodonta mexicana and uh, Mentha spicata, but also an observation of the two interacting with one another. Now, you can't be 100% sure that the Isodonta is pollinating the Mentha spicata, but it quite could quite well do. And so you effectively, by using uh, photographs, often from citizen scientists, you can get uh, three observations for the price of one. And again, artificial intelligence can be used to extract these interactions as well. I briefly mentioned eDNA. Um, it's now well established in aquatic ecosystems, but there's many, many other opportunities for eDNA in soil, um, in gut contents and in air. Um, the one thing that really hasn't been sorted out, uh, even in the aquatic ecosystems, is the data flow. So, but there are um, things happening in GBIF and at the European Nucleotide Archive about making uh, workflows to easily be able to go from eDNA from the lab uh, into data and publishing the observations and the sequences. Um, uh, as soon as possible. And again, we should be looking at workflows that publish these data in a matter of days, uh, not years, as is often the case these days. I've not mentioned literature yet. Um, in the 20th century, uh, all of the data and um, information about biodiversity was published to literature. It's a fantastic resource, but we can digitize and make a lot more of these data. And it's very extremely important baseline data. So the Biodiversity Heritage Library has about 6 million pages, so 60 million pages. Uh, the Biodiversity Literature Repository by Blasi has more than a million. And there's other sources of digital uh, um, literature, such as Wikisource and the Internet Archive, which have millions of uh, pages, though uh, not all of those are about biodiversity, but a large percentage of them are. So that brings me on uh, to one of the projects we've been working on, uh, Bicycle, the Biodiversity Community Integrated Knowledge Library. Um, this project will end at the end of next month, um, but has brought together uh, infrastructures from, um, uh, from Europe uh, for, that are uh, related to all many of those different data types that I've talked before. So it's led by Pensoft in Bulgaria, who work on literature, uh, but also Plazi works on literature as well, um, and also EuroPub Med. Uh, the European Nucleotide Archive is in there, and they work on sequence data, and so does Pluto F. Uh, we're in there, Miser Botanic Garden, with Berlin Botanic Garden and Naturalis, who work on specimens, and uh, GBIF is there for observations. And all of these... Uh, Infrastructure, they're not silos, they're all open, they share their data openly, but we do have a problem that these data types are not very easy uh, to transverse. So um, we have, uh, Bicycle is very much about enabling better access to these kinds of data, making these data fair, but also creating unidirectional, bidirectional links between these kinds of data. So if you have a specimen and you want to know uh, were any sequences made from this specimen at the moment, or at least before bicycle, it was very hard to go from that specimen to ENA and find out um, the nature of that sequence. Or if there was a correction made to the specimen, how could that co correction be sent to the sequence, as, uh, the sequence database as well? And that goes for the links to literature to sequences and the literature to specimens and uh, vice versa. So Bicycle was all about that, and uh, we recently just um, uh, submitted another grant to try and extend that work and make it even more accessible. And it's very much about trying to put you know, biodiversity data together and create the links between them. 
But uh, what I'm going to talk about now is the project that we uh, that's been going a year that we're coordinating here at Miser uh, called B Cubed. Uh, it's not really called B three, although I hear a lot of people calling it that. Um, that's okay. I'll understand what you're talking about. Um, and it's about um, biodiversity building blocks of policy. So it's about biodiversity data cubes. Um, it's funded by the European Union under Horizon Europe, and it wasn't funded under a biodiversity call. It was funded under a governance call uh, uh, to do with governance and environmental observation data. So the whole idea is to, to understand biodiversity data much better and provide policy relevant information from that biodiversity data. It's about aggregating all of those different data types that I showed before, standardizing this data into a biodiversity data cube, maintaining all the provenance of those data, um, creating derivatives from them, and doing this in a repeatable way so you can run the workflows uh, again and again. And as you get new data, uh, you can see in the data and you don't, uh, data and outputs don't get old very quickly. So you can create models out of these indicators out there, these and potentially also um, as species interaction networks, for instance. The tenants of B cubed are definitely about open data. We can't aggregate data from all over the place uh, if we don't have data under Creative Commons licenses, as I said before. It's about open science, so it's about creating code that anybody can run on these cubes. It's not about very complicated things. Um, it's about connecting very transparently the data to the policies. Um, and it's about creating an analysis ready data sets that anybody can use. And so we're very much looking at creating tools that uh, users can use either as they are or adapt for their own usage. There's also challenges in doing this. Um, uh, challenges of spatial resolution, extent, the different sorts of data I mentioned before come with very different uncertainties and very different parameters. Uh, they're all different, very different methodologies. Um, and you have to understand the biology of the organism in the end. The, the results uh, do depend, uh, for instance, on how fast that animal moves around, for instance, or whether it's a stationary organism. And we have to deal with interoperability, although that's solved largely through using GBIF. So uh, in that project, we have um, four different case studies. We haven't started any of those. Those in the last year, but we will create the tools in the first uh, couple of years. Um, one of the case studies is looking at uh, an area at Flanders where we have a lot of data and it's a relatively um, dense urban, uh, urban uh, sort of environment. Another case study is in South Africa. We have two South African partners, uh, Sanbi, and the University of Stellenbosch, and they're interested in running a pilot on um, biological invasions. And that's the sort of low amounts of data, um, high spatial extent uh, um, case study. And uh, we have a stakeholder driven case study that is still to be determined, but we are leaning towards working on something to do with the Habitat Directive of the EU for that particular one. And finally, we have a case study where we're trying to look at uh, biodiversity globally and seeing what can be achieved, uh, maybe looking at indicators globally. I don't know how, excess, uh, how effective that will be, but it'll be very interesting to try. So just to give you one example of something we're working on at MISO at the moment is uh, indicators for phylogenetic diversity. Um, this is a rather more nuanced uh, measurement of diversity than a simple alpha diversity. Um, it's, a, um, it's been recommended by a number of different groups. Um, and uh, I will just skip through this because I'm going to run out of time if I don't. Um, but um, there's, it's very useful for looking at to, to whether particular sites are, are good for conservation worthiness. And we can create a workflow, something like this, where we start off with raw occurrences, create data cubes, uh, use software to calculate the different metrics of phylogenetic diversity, merge them uh, with a phylogenetic tree to do this. And then um, in this particular case, we're looking at uh, then combining data on protected areas to get uh, maps suitable for conservation planning, something along the lines of this. And I should just credit Lisa Brugelmans for my team who's been doing all of this work. 
Um, we also have indicators. Uh, Sean Dove from um, Giesen University has been doing this, uh, in this particular case, looking at other uh, measures of biodiversity uh, on larger spatial scales as well. So getting back uh, to the vision of the Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, um, as I said, this all has to be achieved by 2050. But perhaps you can see uh, that a lot has been achieved in the last 25 years, and it is hard to see forward how we will achieve all of this in the next 25 years. But I hope you will agree that in the past 25 years, we've set a very good foundation for what can potentially be done. There is a lot to do, um, but uh, sharing um, the results, uh, being open with our data, um, not for our own benefit, uh, particularly, but it is for your benefit in terms of uh, the the um, the credit you'll get for doing that, um, and also the the results you'll get back from it. Um, I think it is worth your while. Now, I did uh, think to uh, that some people might wonder why I put this fish in the advertising for the uh, for the uh, seminar. Um, I just think the biodiversity uh, comes at us uh, in all our lives, that we get inspired by biodiversity. As, as someone who works on biodiversity, I'm sure most of you uh, as well uh, do it for the love of it. We don't do it because they provide services to us, even though uh, we're very happy to have oxygen to breathe as well. And this fish uh, it's not a real fish. I don't think it could really exist. It has some various things wrong with it to be a proper fish. Uh, but somebody was inspired to brighten up uh, Natural Factor Street in Athens uh, with this fish. And uh, I'm for one, very glad that they did. And that I'm glad they appreciate the biodiversity. So these are my partners in Be Cubed. Uh, there are also many other partners uh, in other projects that I haven't mentioned here, I'm afraid. Um, but um, this is a... Uh, my current set of teammates and I will stop now for questions. Um, if there are no questions, I'll tell you what the bat is about. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. There's a lot of questions, so you will not have to fill in with that. Um, but thanks for explaining the visual. It was quite striking. And underneath the graffiti is the word ruin, which I thought was um, quite poetic as well. Um, but thank you. Um, that was amazing. I did spot the logo of R in my master's degree. We had a component where we were taught R and I must say that was triggering for me. It was a lot of post-traumatic stress. I didn't like it. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So let's go to the questions. Um, Anthony Antonucci asks, uh, will there be biodiversity data sets driven by citizen science observation data? And academic observation data and government observation data, how will genuine and reliable and clean data be assured? Um, what are the safeguards, I guess, against that? Yeah, that's a very big question, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, you can create uh, data sets like that if you can figure out which data set is which. And we can certainly do that from the, the technology that GBIF has put into place for creating so you can select a certain set of data sets and create cubes doing that. Um, how you put safeguards in place. So repeatable publishing of data sets. So take the iNaturalist one. I think it's, it's published every week. Um, every single iNaturalist record is open for people to correct forever. I mean, I don't forever is a very long time, but no, nothing on iNaturalist is closed. I don't trust the professional ones. They tend to be published once, they're never corrected, and there's no voucher. So with iNaturalist, I have a picture, I can I can validate it. So I really like iNaturalist, you can probably tell. Um, and I do trust it because I have all the full provenance, um, whereas I don't have that of the professional data sets. Um, how, you, how you provide quality assurance of the professional ones, extremely difficult, uh, because people tend to be very closed about them and don't maintain them. But uh, for the open ones like iNaturalist, you can very easily. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's another presentation on its own, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, Srishti Manna asks, uh, is there an open database that can show which tree species provide shelters to which classes of animals? Maybe Ooh. helpful 
in case that's of a very in interesting question so yes and no so this uh, <laughs> so i would start by going to globi which is the global biodiversity interactions database I, i've contributed data there as well it's, it's fully open and so it has interactions between all sorts of different organisms uh, but one of the reasons I put the bat in there is because one of the groups I'm involved with is a bat group. And we've been uh, publishing to Globy, but also we'll publish a, a proper paper eventually on the interactions between bats and other organisms. So uh, it's not really me. I, I just go along on Wednesday afternoons and talk a lot. Um, but they have a big data set of roost sites of bats, for instance. And so if you're interested in what sort of sites different kind of bat species to roost in uh, then there are data sets for that and there are probably other data sets i just don't know of for other other creatures yeah that's amazing i love that picture of the bat and the story you told with it um i'm from india and you know there's a group that was working on bats and their roost sites within temples and there's a lot um because a lot of right. them are old and a lot of them are dark and damp so i mean it, it would be a similar data set this, this study emerged out of the pandemic as you might guess um and uh, because they were interested to know how easily it would be for bats to transmit between different species of bat and of course you need to know where where they come together to be able to do that so the bats that roost together are like to spread disease amongst themselves i mean i would i have a question for myself um is that this is not a combative question, but I was curious about the emission profile of this kind of data storage. And it, it must be massive, but just looking at the number, the amount of data that, you know, it's handling. Um, I'm guessing that it's offset in some way. It has come up in a couple of conversations recently. And uh, certainly for Horizon Europe, uh, we have the do so, so no significant harm policy, which mm -hmm. is raising awareness of this. I don't think we're there yet really on all of this. I don't, we're certainly not the worst. I mean, things like Netflix, I just dread to think what that would be. But as uh, biodiversity scientists, we are aware of this. I don't think we have all the policies in place to fully resolve this, but it, it's, it's not like we're ignoring it, let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I would hate to compare us to Netflix, you know? I mean, I guess the question would be, more of ethics rather than you know the yes. the, the extent of harm done. Um, there's lots of questions. I don't know if you'll be able to. I don't know how much capacity you have, Quentin. But yeah. I'll just try to get through them. Um, Elena Bizina asks, um, "This is great. The amount of raw data is huge, but what about the metrics of biodiversity, such as indices, percentage of invasive species, uh, how are they calculated and monitored, and how they change through time on sampling plots? Is there any organization doing this?" It's very, very patchy. So in some countries, in some places, in some countries, they have, uh, there are so few uh, long-term data sets, but you have, for instance, the ELTER, L-T-E-R organization that have uh, sites around the world. Um, and that's, uh, there are quite a few sites in Europe for that, doing long-term things. Um, Long-term is long-term with biodiversity, so tens of years, hundreds of years even, and there are very, very few data sets um, that have that kind of longevity. Um, what data we have is all very patchy, and so you have to try and make use of this as best you can. Um, it's the data we have. It's not pretty. Um, we, we, You have to kind of know a bit about how it was created to try and understand it. Um, so those kind of things do exist. Proportion, if you work on proportions, it's easier than working on absolutes with this kind of data, for sure. And not only do the methods and how their methods are implemented affect it, but also the detectability of the individual organism. Uh, uh, a red kite I was saw just yesterday, very obvious bird, easily identifiable. Uh, you can tick that off. But the fungus on the ground, which is probably a lot more common, is never going to be observed and so it, yeah detectability is a massive issue as well yeah in fact somebody had a similar question um to what you just touched upon it's about you know abundance and how much um that can be um oh yeah she asked the, so elena asked the question because they have done a study in siberia to estimate the impact of mining companies on biodiversity at four locations with metrics and that has been interesting yeah, 
uh, so really good data, I'm sure. I, I also sure that it'd be very hard to go back in 10 years time to repeat that same yeah. thing as well because of getting funding for that kind of thing. Um, but as a baseline study um, to look at how things improved in the future would be, it's really nice. And also, I mean, I didn't mention it, but but also, you know, PhD students go on to do other things. They they leave their data and if they haven't published it and made it open at that point, then people forget how it was created. So all that metadata that was associated with it that's in someone's head gets lost. And then um, there's very good evidence that these data just get lost because no one can publish them anymore because they don't know what the column names mean, for instance. Yeah. Well, the scaffolding was, yeah. Yes. Um, here, there's, uh, here's Zylo from the Indigenous Navigator and Forest Peoples Program. Um, are any of these initiatives working on or compiling data on human rights dimensions of biodiversity that are also included in KMGBF? Uh, particularly keen to hear about those related to Indigenous peoples' rights, but right. also others. Not, I'm not an expert in any of this, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to go to, to Montserrat, for instance, in uh, one of the UK overseas territories uh, to work on helping uh, them conserve their biodiversity. Um, but also at the same time, we were looking at where collections are from Montserrat. Um, I guess you might call them indigenous people. I don't know if they treat themselves as such. Um, I'm not really sure. But people in the tropics in general, uh, indigenous peoples all over the world, things like this, have very similar problems of of um and, and you know the the they see the rich uh north having massive collections that were lightly taken without permission from their countries and they don't know how to use those data um we may be digitizing the stuff and sending it back to them but that may not be what they want um Organizations like IPBES have a very high profile for indigenous peoples. Um, uh, when you work on an IPBES assessment, uh, you definitely have to uh, consider um, indigenous people. So we, we were working on invasive species, which for indigenous people um, is generally a problem for them uh, because they don't have knowledge on, in, on invasive species and so what to do when something comes in. And they're forced to adapt and they also don't have any money or any resources to be able to do anything about it. And so uh, these are all very important issues, but there is also a lot of work to be done in that area too. And it very much varies between countries of what is being done. So it probably doesn't answer your question very well, I'm afraid. But... Um, Beyond Roberts asks, thinking of making progress towards Kunming Montreal goals, do the initiatives that you have outlined include guidance for attribution of observed change in biodiversity to actions to conserve and restore? I mean, uh, even with the IT targets, I was wondering if I know that they have no particular teeth when it comes to actual you know, accountability, but did it in any way, um, I don't know, spur a nation to come up with their own biodiversity targets that are possibly legal and binding? I think it definitely did. Um, that is, it's often hard to see how the how it worked, but you know, when you apply for, for instance, uh, European funding through Horizon Europe, they specifically say that a call is specifically trying to address and reach targets on the Kunming biodiversity. And you, when you write your proposal, you have to say how this helps towards those targets. So those targets are translated into policy, at least in the research funding area, which I know better, <laughs> better than many other policies. Uh, I don't know the policies very well, for instance, in agriculture and fisheries and things like this, but I imagine it's a similar sort of thing. Um, it's perhaps easier in research than it is in, in, in the industry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, um, here's a, here, I mean, this is an interesting one. What do you, how do you think bioinformatics will develop in the future? I mean, I guess everybody's wondering about AI now and, you know, if, if it can just crawl through data and find interconnections. I mean, much of it might not be helpful at all, but... It is extremely difficult. <laughs> so uh, it will be more automation. AI will help a massive amount, but we, have, but actually it's a data science that's the trick. So, so for instance, for eDNA, uh, we obviously don't have barcodes for every species, 
but we are creating libraries, uh, validated libraries for these. We also, uh, for camera trap data, the models used for identifying things are going to get better and better and better. So what happens when you publish your data set and you throw away all the images or you throw away all the DNA and you just rely on the data you collected at that time? If you analyze that in 10 years time, the models will be better. We'll have more barcode sequences and things like this and many more things could be identified. And so... Um, Potentially, you need systems to be able to store the images, store the sequences, and be able to reanalyze that and republish all of that data. And that's difficult and um, to be able to do that, handle all that data. And it needs infrastructures to do it. So it's not something that uh, a PhD student could set up or something like that. It needs long-term infrastructural funding. And even for infrastructures, we'll struggle to, to do that kind of thing. I guess, you, I mean, the one thing that you didn't touch upon would be eco-acoustics, and a lot of data is being collected in that field. I mean, we had a talk last week about the amount of data that's being collected because of the ease of ease of collecting it now. And is that something that you have looked at? Or, I mean, what well, is needed? As a botanist, I don't, I don't have many options. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, if in a, the collection is very different to camera traps, but it's the same principle effectively and the data workflows um there's an identification step uh there's a step where you configure the data to standardize it to where, whereby you can publish it and you need to make sure the metadata are correct um so that people can understand how you collected it and what errors there might be within the data and then you need to actually publish it um and so the detection method is is important but uh, that all the data analysis and data publication steps are the same as many of these other things. Yeah. Uh, so we just have two minutes left, and I think I will end with Dr. Sabrina Naz's questions. Um, she would like to know if you have if you have focused on microorganisms like phytoplankton, zooplankton, benthos, or micro. No, I'm afraid not. They... <laughs> so really vascular plants, not even bryophytes. I'm afraid for my personal <laughs> interest. Uh, and there is a big problem for data on these things. I mean, maybe more in the marine area. Um, maybe we have to look at sort of groups of organisms rather than individual species. Um, yeah, if I was a marine biologist, I'd probably tell you a lot of things about um, uh, some of the sort of micro camera traps they have for looking at uh, mm. uh, these things, but I'm not, and I'm also not a soil biologist as well. <laughs> so there's probably lots of things I don't know about, but um, yeah. I don't know about those personally. Interesting. I've never seen feed from micro camera traps, but it sounds pretty interesting. I think um, they go to Bliss in, in Belgium, I think. So. Okay, right. And um, do you, would you have any tips or leads on collaboration with small climate vulnerable countries like Bangladesh? Perhaps you've come across any projects that you could talk about? Uh, well, yeah, I work with Montserrat, but it's a tiny, tiny amount of money, really, uh, looking at ways... So, for instance, one one real nice initiative I've seen is the, the GBF hosted portals. So setting up a portal for a country is expensive and you need long term maintenance. Um, GBF will provide this function of creating a portal for a country um, to show all the data and make it much more accessible. They can do it in the local language and things like that. So so those sort of things are important. Um, We've run bio blitzes and things to teach people how to use apps. So uh, using iNaturalist and other apps is a very good way. Um, even in quite poor countries, apps are more common than computers these days because uh, everyone needs access to the internet for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so doing, doing that kind of thing, um, I guess it really depends on the local situation. I'd love to know that the, the local situation is in Bangladesh, so maybe uh, they should do a talk on the situation of biodiversity observation in, in Bangladesh. It would be very interesting. And I think that's it, Quentin. Thank you so much for your time and yeah. for logging in today. And that's it from us. Um, have a very good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.